Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first seminar in this new season at CSDS. Uh, and we have, we're very lucky that we have with us uh, Francis Cody, who's written this remarkable new book. And if I understand correctly, this is the first event of the book, and we're very glad to have it in India. Uh, so Frank is going to speak at Law at Large, the news event in public mediations of community. And I've known Frank for many years. And his work is actually quite remarkable, and I'll talk a bit about it. But just a brief introduction, uh, Francis Cody is, a, is an associate professor at the Department of Anthropology and Asian Institute at the University of Toronto. His first book, The Light of Knowledge, won the 2014 Edward Sapir Book Prize. So this new book explores questions of law, technology, and violence in the context of journalism and populist politics. But before I give it over to Frank, uh, I want to set up the kind of stage uh, of this seminar today. It's important to address that stage. And I think there were two important burdens that the social sciences and the humanities faced in the 20th and 21st century as, as far as media and technology were concerned. The first burden, which is a well-known burden, is the so-called dematerialization thesis, which Bill Brown has this very lovely phrase where he calls this the melodrama of materiality, where media was seen from the 1920s onwards as destroying the ability of us to sense the world and to make meaning. So this really, this dematerialization thesis was the organizing principle of critical theory, uh, of social sciences, of uh, counterculture, uh, you know, you had, uh, you know, critical theory at Debord. So here the technical medium, the technical medium is, which is externalized is a way in which it prevents us from seeing things in themselves. So the second challenge for the social sciences and humanities was the ideology thesis. By ideology, I mean a double inversion in consciousness and reality. So caught in this fog of ideology, we cannot sense the world because of this prism of technically organized ideology. So you had Frankfurt School, psychoanalytic Marxism, Laura Mulvey's famous earlier phase of the male gaze, versions of the linguistic turn. Now, some versions of this argument have surfaced in recent years in this all these debates on platform capitalism. And Frank actually very nicely addresses that in a very succinct, cleanly, wonderfully written introduction. What we've seen very productively is a, a kind of environmental turn in scholarship, in media scholarship. And therefore, you've had the occasion where this book, I think, is a very productive exercise to open up new conversations between the humanities and the social sciences and media scholarship. The earlier boundaries of analytically, you know, uh, data-driven uh, media scholarship uh, and, so, you know, social sciences ha have now blurred. So what is, the, what, is the, what is the question here? So take, let me set up a contrast and then Frank can start. So Marshall, uh, the development of media technology operated and he wrote in the 1960s as an externalization of the nervous system. So it's really centered on the, on the human. So in today's terms, this can be described as a kind of distribution of human cognitive capacities. Now, how would we reassemble this human-centered argument about media, which is kind of environmental because it goes beyond this logic of representation into different, into a larger environmental thought. So here you have a shift from new media as a set of discrete objects, an object, a radio, a TV, to a sort of interlocked process of mediation, what you know, Frank is going to talk about more, mediatization. So mediatization, which he frames, I think, very interestingly, is a political and material field of the collective. Therefore, it's generative of political action, new forms of action. So it's not, the event becomes a chain. What is the border between an object and an event? And it therefore demands, there's an urgency of critical investigation. It, it's posing a new challenge for the social sciences. It demands attention. You have to investigate. What are the terms of this investigation? And this is where I think Frank's work comes in very interestingly. As an, It's an anthropology of media, as a political field, as a political mediatized field, where the borders between representation and a generative field pose great challenges, research challenges. And also, which is set up in all his chapters, they provide immense op opportunities for political subjects, parties, I don't have to talk more about what the country we're living in, activists, courts. 
So you have this, you also see overlaps between the anthropology of law in a world of mediatization and an anthropology of critical events, referencing what Vinodas wrote in a media age. So it's a kind of moving back and forth, it's a history of you know, scholarship and a kind of looking forward. So here, if the news event is central for the crafting of collective and public speech, the challenge, the challenge is to ride and orchestrate the time technology of media where events become crucial to the making of value. And sovereignty is a form of value making, right? So scalability and expansion, I think, which is very interesting. How do you scale? How do you move beyond? How do you expand? How do you limit? Challenge earlier models of the earlier tradition, dematerialization, idea, paranoid media analysis. I mean, paranoid thought can be productive sometimes uh, in a contemporary art and cinema, but it, it provides interesting sites for investigation. So here, and I quote, and Frank, then I give it to you. And Frank poses this question. It's a very nice para which I like. And he asks, what kind of actions and events are possible in a world so saturated where the force of media coverage is thoroughly enmeshed with that on which it reports? Can institutions like the law continue to claim autonomy under such conditions? What, what is the law? And what is the law? What is the form of legal speech? This normative, you know, uh, you know, view. Can news media them claim to be independent observers and reporters of the effects? Let's stop here. Give it over to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, this is really uh, an honor to be here because um, so many of the ideas that I'm working through in this book um, have passed through this room in various forms at various times, and um, the work at SARI and CSTS has been such an inspiration. Um, I wouldn't have probably even studied legal issues. I, mean, I had already gone to the high court and stuff, but I had no idea what to make of it until uh, a conference that uh, that happened in this room. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to uh, Ravi for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll just say a word about the, the news event as a, as a concept. Um, I, Ravi's already started to introduce the idea. Um, but it's really um, a, a, a methodology I developed when, when thinking through these materials. Um, and it's, it's focusing on that moment where it becomes very difficult to distinguish between events being reported in the news, stuff that's happening out there in the world, and then the event of media coverage. Media coverage itself becomes an event. Um, and that's, that's what I've thought about as, as the news event. It's a rather abstract concept. I mean, we're used to now the fact that a video is circulating becomes news. I mean, I don't need to tell you this, um, but this has an older history that I was interested in kind of uh, uh, unfolding a little bit. Um, and so I, I can just give a, a brief example from a long time ago, 2001. I start the book with um, uh, the arrest of uh, uh, Mukarnandi, who was the, the leader of the DMK. At the time, he had just lost the election to Jailanta, uh, who had become chief minister and she was seeking revenge for charges of corruption he had um, foisted upon her uh, when he was uh, the chief minister uh, the, uh, just a year earlier. Um, and uh, so the, the Chennai police arrested Karanadi in, the, in his house uh, at 1.30 in the morning um, on charges of corruption. Uh, now what the police didn't anticipate, what Jailata as chief minister did not anticipate was the fact that there was gonna be a camera crew on site and this was recorded. Uh, the, 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 the rather brutal arrest, kind of getting, uh, you know, he was in his 70s at the time, getting dragged out of bed and, and um, taken to um, the police station. Um, and this was then the following day shown on a loop, uh, uh, just a couple minutes of footage shown over and over again and making people very angry. Um, and eventually the charges were dropped and uh, it cost Jailita quite a bit of political clout. But this is the kind of uh, event that interests me because when you talk about that arrest, it becomes very difficult to distinguish the legal issues uh, and the arrest from the footage through which people experience the arrest as, as, a, as a mass event. Um, and so that's an example of a news event uh, in, in the sort of more technical sense I'm talking about um, that you know, predates the era of WhatsApp and all that sort of stuff. So we've become much more attuned to this but it's something that has a, a longer history that I draw it, uh, in, in the book. Um, so that uh, helps illuminate the concept. Now, this is a, a, a story that I think is, um, it's apt to tell through materials from uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, in part because political parties have been so invested in mass media as a means of displaying their sovereignty. 
uh, as the true leaders of the Tamil people. I mean, there's the history of film, of course, and the connection to politics, uh, but also news media. Uh, so Sun TV, which captured the arrest, is a, a family channel, as it were. It belongs to the, the larger Karnalini family. Um, and so that connection between politics and news media has a, a very old history there. Um, and, and that's part of the story that I tell as well. So there's kind of a, the, the conceptual level and, and this kind of historical level of transformations in Tamil politics as, uh, as a, a mediatization, as both kind of an awareness of the fact of mass media being the conditions under which politics are played out. Um, and the fact that this technology is constantly morphing. Um, and so the, the book covers uh, uh, nearly uh, about 20, 25 years of, uh, of events to try to unravel this problematic. Um, and so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on a chapter that um, deals with uh, reporting at the, at the high court uh, in, in Madras, um, which was a very uh, eventful place uh, um, uh, at the time that I was doing my research around 2015. Um, and I'll, I'll start next with a story that some of you might be familiar with. Um, and I'll, I'll read to give you a, a sense of the, of the chapter and how, how it goes. Um, so it began with fictionalized sex and it ended with a resurrection. In between the Tamil novelist, Pirumal Murugan declared himself dead as a writer. His award-winning novel, Madhur Wagan, had already been published for years and translated into English as one part woman when some Hindu nationalists and caste affiliated groups objected violently to the book. Um, I forgot to put my slides here. Yes? Can I use the, the mouse? Ah, there we go. So that's the book cover. Uh, and now I'm going to show you Perman Murugan's book cover. There we go. Um, so this tale of a childless couple's difficult search for the social recognition that comes only with progeny draws on deeply researched oral lore. It's set during the colonial period. Madhurubagan, a local name for Lord Shiva as half man and half woman, drew the ire of some readers because it depicts consensual extramarital and intercaste sexual relations that were once known to have taken place on the 18th day of a temple festival in the town of Trichingod in Western Tamil Nadu. In the book, the loving wife reluctantly takes part in this celebration where gods mingled with humans for one night in hopes of ending her isolation by giving birth to a Sami Kurtapile, a God-given child, the name given to those conceived in this manner. But memories of the ritually sanctioned mesalliance enabling these divine blessings are largely ignored, or perhaps they're purposefully repressed in a contemporary imagination that is more focused on the problem of women's chastity in maintaining religious and caste boundaries. Pirmal Murugan hails from this part of Tamar country, known as Kungunadu, where the story is set. Um, apart from his established fame in literary circles, the author is also a Tamar professor and uh, was a well-known critic of caste hierarchy. Pirmal Murugan's novel thus provided a pretext for an orchestrated campaign of pious outrage against him and his book on the grounds that he had tarnished the reputation of women belonging to the Gounder or Kongo Velara caste. Thanks. Gounder associations organized book burnings and threatened the author and his family with the aid of the Hindu Munani, a religious nationalist group. Fearing a law and order problem, a local district revenue officer took an unusual step. He forced Piruman Murugan to sign an official document promising to withdraw the book, even after the author had already issued an apology and agreed to remove the offending passages from the book. This was already a major news event in, uh, in India, uh, but people were much more shocked by what came next. The distraught author wrote a message on his Facebook page. He declared that he's a writer who is no God and will so will not rise from the dead. He will no longer write. This was followed by a declaration that, quote, hereafter, the humble teacher P. Murugan will live. His post went on to ask that his publishers no longer sell any of his books and that he be left alone. He had withdrawn from literary life altogether. This violent assault on creativity was covered across the globe. It was featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, and a number of uh, news outlets uh, as a sign of growing intolerance. Now, life was returned to Pirmal Murugan, however unexpectedly, through the magical words of a judge. 
Responding to a criminal case against the author that was brought to the Madras High Court, Chief Justice Sanjay Kol wrote a 150 page judgment that many consider to be a piece of literature in its own right. In defending Pirwan Murgan's creative expression and chastising the administration for its failure to protect the constitution, the judgment begins by delving into the history of censorship, it goes back to Lady Chatterley's lover and I mean, it's very erudite. After going through specific merits of the case before the court and dismissing any crime that is alleged to have occurred, the judgment then moves back into the domain of broader socio-historical commentary, noting, quote, the rising phenomenon of extrajudicial, casteist, and religious forces dictating the creativity of authors and writers. The judgment also contrasts contemporary popular morality with the more flexible norms of sex outside of wedlock in the classical Indian religious traditions that, quote, truly reflect the liberal ethos, uncorrupted by the Victorian English philosophy, which came to dominate post the British invasion of India, end quote. This lengthy and erudite meditation on uh, art, sex, and religion then ends with a very quotable piece of legal prose. The last line is in bold. This comes from the judgment itself. Let the author be resurrected to what he's best at, right? It was reproduced in all the news media the following day and quickly prompted a public reply from a grateful Pirumal Murgan, again via Facebook, um, who wrote that the judge's words had given him great happiness, comforting a heart that had shrunk itself and had wilted. I'm trying to prop myself up, holding on to the light of the last lines of the judgment. So in that way, Pirumal Murgan had been entered into the whole free speech movement, we might say. I happened to be in a taxi cab with a, a reporter, a freelancer, um, a couple days after the judgment uh, came out, and he got a call from Pirman Murgan on his phone. He didn't know him, the, the author himself. Uh, he was thrilled to get this phone call. Apparently, he had written an interesting commentary on the judgment in Tamar, in an online uh, news source, and Pirman Murgan was very keen to meet the author of the commentary. And so we met up at the press club, um, and, and Pirman Murgan just basically explained how important it is for people to know about the judgment and that this should be reproduced as widely as possible so that people know that the, the court is out there to protect people. Um, so that was a kind of just a, a coincidence that I think helped me understand how a judgment can sort of reach a, a single life in a way that I, I hadn't understood before. So the story of Piruman Murugan, his death as a writer and his resurrection through the words of Chief Justice called, presents the law in the image of a benevolent authority, sitting above the narrow-mindedness of those who refuse to grant creativity at space of free play, or who fail to understand the truly liberal ethos of Indian religions prior to colonialism. The law appears transcendent here. Judges themselves might be thought to epitomize the ethics of an enlightened distance that are required for the law to apply impartially to all. That's the ideal. And yet, the social force of the Piruman Murugan judgment made itself felt through publicly circulating parts of the text that have no legal binding. The frequently quoted extracts consist wholly of what those in legal professions might call obiter dicta, things said by way of argument as opposed to the ratio decidendi, the reason for the decision that sets a compulsory standard for other courts to follow within a jurisdiction. What freed the author to write was not simply a decision in a criminal case. More importantly, it was just this call, speaking to the words, to the world by means of a legal judgment. Now, returning to Piruman Murugan's conversation with Money, the journalist I mentioned, we can see furthermore how the public life of law is sustained not only by the judgment itself, which relatively few will read, the 150 pages, but also by the way in which the law is invoked, portrayed, narrativized in print journalism, in film, and on television. When, quote, jurisprudence steps off its elitist pedestal, end quote, to borrow an evocative figuration from Peter Goodrich, it enters the domain of popular ethical and political imagination. The law is addressed to and frequently cited in the world at large well beyond the obligatory chain of ratio decidendi in arguing cases. And it's done so to support or contest various ethical and political projects, exerting force in and being mediated by wider social fields denied, uh, defined by dynamics of mass publicity. 
So thinking with and beyond Max Weber's well-known argument about inherent incongruities between the substance of popular justice and the rationalized form of legal procedure, this talk extends our analysis of this broader force of law by examining judicial address and its mediation by news consuming publics. While the Indian higher judiciary aspires to a self-image as a unified power sitting above a deeply fractured society, the news media in particular have ensured that the law's tentacles spread deeply into the recesses of everyday life and considerations of justice through the circulation of its discourse. Adopting a stance that addresses the public from afar, judicial discourse employs a rhetoric of autonomy, neutrality, and universality, universality delineating a juridical field that nevertheless it seeks to intervene in society from which it stands aloof. In considering the role of the court as a political actor then, my interest is in the tension at play between the ethics and the aesthetics of distance required to maintain this institution's appearance of majesty and impartiality on one hand, and the pull of public address and narrative form which the judiciary draws its language from and exerts its broader force in well beyond the letter of the law on the other hand. And I think this tension tells us a great deal about the public life of community and caste in uh, the juridical field. In a brilliant anthropological reading of what Vina Das once called the semiotic excess of judicial discourse beyond the narrow confines of the immediate decision, she demonstrates how judgments can serve as a gambit for establishing a juridical state monopoly, not only on legitimate violence, but on authorizing legitimate forms of collective identity, behavior, and memory. Extending these insights into the narrative and event-making quality of legal judgments, I ask how the very mediation of judicial discourse by publics that constitutes the court's authority in society at large also opens the judiciary to vulnerabilities on the very same grounds of mass publicity. To the degree that judges are concerned with maintaining their image of distance that is somewhat aristocratic, even ascetic, they're in fact radically dependent on a form of public recognition that must be maintained. In the words of uh, Rajiv Dhawan, the majesty of the law is very much bound up in how it's perceived. If this is taken away, the law and its custodians will be demythologized. Their mask would disappear. Court proceedings would be like any other meeting and all the less convincing for being so, end quote. So this is a symbolic order that is subject to the vagaries of a sometimes raucous news media, eliciting accusations of contempt of court when breached. In this respect, the law of contempt, which criminalizes scandalizing a judge before the public is to the judiciary what criminal defamation is to political leaders. And I have a chapter in the book about criminal defamation, which was very widely used against the press, especially under Jayalalitha's rule uh, in Tamil Nadu. And the law in a similar manner as it does in, in, in uh, criminal defamation can blur the line between the reputation of a particular judge and broader concerns about the prestige of the court and the law itself. It's this sort of blurring the line between the state and the leader, blurring the line between the court and the judge that uh, is uh, entailed by the use of this law oftentimes. Because the, the accusation is that you've lowered the, the, the court itself by uh, misrepresenting me, the judge. So judges must take into account quite seriously the wider effect and uptake of their arguments in such a context, one can imagine. Um, as the former Delhi High Court Justice A.P. Shaw once remarked to me when I told him about my research at a cocktail party, he said, I know most judges can't have their morning coffee without first reading about themselves in the newspaper. Now, how this reading feeds back into judgments and observations is an interesting question. Such a study of uh, reflections on publicity uh, in the more intimate sphere uh, would yield great insight into the dynamics of calculation and maneuver and legal performativity, but it is beyond the scope of this talk. I didn't get to know judges very well. Um, what I have is a set of interpretations of public records um, in the form of higher court judgments, news media representations, uh, and ethnography read through the lens of local reporters uh, who did the work of mediating the law for public consumption and interpretation. So I'm now going to introduce you to the Madras High Court. A prominent statue stands at the center of the graceful Indo-Saracenic buildings that make up the Madras High Court complex. It depicts the lawgiver and model judge, the emperor Manunidi Cholan, also known as Yellalan, the ruler of the boundary. Sculpted from dark stone in the Neo-Dravidian style of the late 20th century, the statue stakes claims to a thumb revision of justice amid its colonial era surroundings. 
unlike his Roman counterpart, Justicia, who's found in many courts with her eyes blindfolded, holding a scale in one hand and a sword on the other, this great Chola king's eyes are large and they're wide open. He carries a scepter. The legend depicted by the sculpture has it that the king kept a giant bell for anyone to ring and be heard to report an injustice. One day, a cow rang the bell, demanding action against the king's only son, the prince, who is said to have crushed her calf under the wheel of a chariot. Upon hearing the cow's complaint, the sovereign demanded that his own son be put to death in the very same manner. So the prince's body is there depicted at the base of the sculpture being crushed under a chariot wheel opposite another wheel, which sits upon the dead calf. So the functions of lawmaker and law preserver are not delineated here. As the sovereign, Mananidi rules on behalf of all people and animals, not blindly or according to a procedure set from without. In proceedings at the Madras High Court, where I would regularly spend time with reporters, justice was certainly not always as equitable as the legend of Mananidi Cholan would demand. But I think his image nevertheless provides an interesting entry point to some of the conflicting tensions at play in the often dramatic cases that are decided in this complex, where worldly considerations of representing and safeguarding the diverse populace of Tamil Nadu vie with much more abstract claims based uh, on behalf of universal principles of law. And I'll just, my, my field work basically consisted of coming in every day and hanging out with reporters in a, a separate room that was where the press was allowed to, to set up their computers and stuff. Um, television channels had to sit outside the court um, grounds because you're not allowed to bring uh, television cameras inside. Um, and so it was basically seeing how they reported the cases that happened um, and then reflecting on how, that reporting and how it gets then depicted in the newspaper and on television and so forth, and then talking to people about what they saw. So let me now get into um, the, the main case I'd like to discuss. So one storming, story uh, looming quite large in talk among the reporters at the high court when I arrived in the summer of 2015 began when a young man named Shamil Ahmed died shortly after being mid, admitted to the Rajiv Gandhi uh, government general hospital just down the road from where we were. I first heard about it from journalists I was following in the court. His death was recorded as a small item in newspapers because Shamil had been taken into custody for questioning a few hundred kilometers away in the Palikonda police station near the Andhra Pradesh border 10 days earlier. After four days of interrogation at the police station, Shamil was released and returned home, but immediately admitted to the hospital in nearby Velur for severe internal injuries before being transferred to Chennai, where he died. Most news reports left it at that, and television uh, largely ignored the story. What later became clear is that the married Muslim youth, the father of a young child, was alleged to have run away with a 23-year-old woman named Pi Pavitra, who was also already married and the mother of a young child. The two had worked together in a shoe leather factory away from their respective homes, and they had known each other for about a year. When Pavitra left home after a quarrel with her husband, a man named Palani, that's her husband's name, he proceeded to file a petition for a writ of habeas corpus a recourse demanding uh, the production of her body in court, normally associated with the tradition of civil liberties to be used against unlawful detention. Here, as in many cases, when women choose to leave home in pursuit of relationships deemed undesirable by their families, the writ was used to demand that the police find someone who is said to be missing. The use of habeas corpus effectively turns a civil right, protecting people from the police into a search warrant empowering the police to apprehend the body. Uh, in the words of Giorgio Agamben, corpus is a two-faced thing, the bearer of both subjection to sovereign power and of individual liberties. Uh, as he notes, corpus is the means by which a body is detained and exhibited before a public. And this is a line of thought that's been, oh, sorry. This is a line of thought that's been uh, picked up by a number of scholars in South Asia. Um, Nasir Hussain has written about this. Um, uh, Pratikra Bakshi, Punyarasu, and Priyatangaraj have all written about how corp corpus has been used um, uh, in basically in an attempt to crack down on relationships that are uh, deemed undesirable by families. So now that Pavitra belonged to a Dalit community, thus doubly reduced to her body as both a woman and a Dalit, 
was never mentioned explicitly in the mainstream news, but it was widely known and discussed among reporters and many others I talked to uh, about this story. And I think they surmised this because of the occupation in the leather factory. What appeared to everyone as a case of death resulting from police torture would have been a relatively minor news event to be handled by city reporters under normal circumstances. Custodial deaths are unfortunately fairly common. The journalist I was chatting with at court agreed that media houses rarely have the appetite for a public confrontation with a police force that they rely a great deal on for their news gathering. But the story gained traction because Pavitra could still not be located by the police. And violence had begun to erupt in Shamil's hometown of Ambur, a town known for its large Muslim population. It turns out that Shamil was not the first young man to have been tortured to death by law enforcement in this manner, and people had lost patience with an unresponsive police force and government. Leaders of the Ambur community, led by Shamil's father-in-law, who was the district head of the Indian Tawhid Jamaat, a social service organization, had already begun protesting his disappearance after they failed in their attempts to contact the inspector of police responsible for his detention. After news of his death circulated, first through WhatsApp and Facebook, then through mainstream Tamar media, protest turned to riot. Most of the crowd's anger was directed at the police and their vehicles. A state-run liquor shop and public buses were destroyed and a few other stores were also severely damaged. A number of policemen and women were injured and around 200 Muslims in the town were picked up for questioning. Many were allowed home after investigations, but 95 people remained in prison over a week after the violence. The police inspector responsible for Shamil's torture, a man by the name of Martin Premraj, was suspended in absentia after the riot. Local, uh, local knowledge in Ambur had it that the same inspector was also in charge during the killing of another Muslim youth in police custody two years earlier. So the inspector had been missing since June 27th, the day after Shamil died in Chennai. It was only because of his suspension that English language media started to cover the story more closely. Meanwhile, Pavitra was last seen uh, by her family in late May, well before this happened, was still in hiding. Although she had visited Shamil in the town of Irod after leaving her husband, he asked her to return to Ambur, knowing the potentials for violence that they would face should they be seen a Muslim man and a Hindu woman together out of wedlock. No one knew where she was. All the while, Ambur was still simmering with tension under the application of Section 144. Uh, politicians worked hard to emphasize some of the communal aspects of the Ambur violence. Vanati uh, 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 Srinivasan, uh, who's now a, a member of uh, uh, the Legislative Assembly and also the national president of the women's wing of the BJP, um, was talking to the press quite a bit and led a lot of um, um, uh, protests. Uh, accusing the Indian Tawhid Jamaat of systematically organizing the violence um, and using Shamil, Shamil's death as a pretext. Now, general media coverage of the violence involving thousands and the massive police repression that followed appeared quite distant from the perspective of readers in metropolitan Chennai, however. This is in a different part of the state. Stories were somewhat limited in the city's papers and television, with the exception of the daily newspaper, Dinamalar, known to be more sympathetic to the BJP. By that point, I was clipping, uh, you know, following events very closely, clipping everything I could find and from the newspapers. This was still when you clipped the paper, <laughs> uh, not that long ago. Uh, but several news editors I spoke to that week played down the importance of the story, explaining that it's not their job to make it larger than it should be. So there's an, this, this sense that like reporting on something is actually adding to the, the, the violence itself. And that's, that's an angle I'm now exploring in much greater depth in more recent research. So the editor from Tamil Murasu, uh, and Evening Daily told me specifically, it's not my job to play into political hands. Um, and so that's why he's not running the story. Um, so this was happening. The story was slowly moving away from the news. Then on a Saturday night, uh, over a week after Shamil had passed away, I received a phone call from a legal reporter uh, I had become friendly with. Frank, did you hear? They found Pavitra by tracing her friend's cell. The phone. Uh, she's been living in a women's hostel here in Chennai all along. Look at your Chennai High Port Reporters WhatsApp group and come to court on Monday. So while Pavitra had gone to Iro to meet with Shamil after leaving home and shortly before he was tortured, police discovered that instead of returning to her village near Ambur, uh, as he had asked her to, she had moved to Chennai in an effort to escape from her family. 
A photograph of Pavitra being escorted to the police station was the front page uh, cover story of every newspaper the following morning. And for obvious reasons, I won't be showing any of these pictures. She had been remanded to the Velour police who had been charged with finding her. And they were told by the local judge to produce Pavitra before the Madras High Court. Already commanding the center of a usually slow uh, Sunday news cycle, the stage was set for a much bigger media event. All attention would be focused on Pavitra's hearing at the Madras High Court on Monday, where she would be produced before the judges, the media, and her family, having broken no law whatsoever, but has a body summoned before the public by writ of habeas corpus. So the court grounds were full of onlookers when I arrived. Amid the dust and crowds, one could uh, barely see the police van carrying Pavitra when it rolled up to the building. A throng of camera persons and photojournalists descended upon the scene, taking pictures from outside the gates, uh, chasing the police as they escorted her up the stairs for the hearing. Um, I made my way to the press room as I normally did. Uh, the older journalists were just sitting there checking their emails, updating their editors on the cell phone, saying, hey, did you see the crowds outside? They were, they'd seen many examples of this type of thing before. The younger ones were hungry to kind of follow the, 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 the story uh, physically. Um, you know, a lot of news reporting does not involve actually going to the courtroom. You're just told what happens uh, and you just type it up. Um, so, but a number of journalists made their way upstairs to the courtroom. Uh, courtroom. Um, so in court, uh, Pavitra was told next to stand next to the appointed government lawyer um, and before the two justices who would hear the, um, the case, uh, while Palani, her husband, uh, looked on holding their five-year-old daughter. They were surrounded by her parents and a sea of spectators. The proceedings began when the judges asked, they were speaking in Tamil throughout, whether Parani was in fact her lawful husband and the facts about the case. Um, did anyone take you away from home unlawfully against your will? But the reply is no. After answering a few initial questions, she told them simply that she would accept returning to her parents' home and expressed her desire to leave her husband. It was in the course of this rather routine line of questioning that Paul Kanagaraj, president of the Madras High Court Advocates Association, who was standing in the front row of onlookers, despite having no official role in the proceedings, interjected. He said, the Ambud riot arose as a result of the ongoing investigation into this woman's disappearance. The judges responded, they say, yeah, we read the newspapers, we know, <laughs> kind of brushed them off a little bit, uh, and then proceeded to nevertheless uh, question Pavitra. Shamil Ahmed was married. You also were married. You had a husband and a child. Then what? Now this youth has died and his family has been harmed as well. It's only because of these problems that religious and caste riots are breaking out. Even unmarried men and women, if they belong to different religions, can only be married under the Special Marriages Act. But here, both are married and with children. When that's the case, how can they get married? That's the judges asking Pavitra. Pavitra tried to assert her rights. She simply said, I want a divorce from my husband. Now, this statement of intent prompted a reply by the judge that would come to actually define the encounter. The judge replied tersely, is divorce something that's available for sale at a corner shop? Something that can be bought with cash? A divorce is something you must file for in another court. You think you can get one just like that? Then the government lawyer uh, added that 50 lakhs worth of property and vehicles were destroyed in the Ambur riot. The investigations about the riot are still going. Uh, Paul Kanagaraj, the lawyer, um, elaborated what he took to be a legal dilemma. The high court should not consider this an or ordinary habeas corpus case. This is because there are no clear laws to deal with problems connected to a man and a woman who are already married living together. Therefore, in light of the unusual problems that have arisen in this rare case, it's important to develop some guidelines about how police should proceed under such conditions. The judges uh, inquired about where Pavitra was currently living, again, asked her whether she would return to her parents' house, um, and it, you know, went back and forth a little bit. And then uh, uh, the session was adjourned, uh, only for her to return the following week when she was officially allowed to go back home to her parents' house. The homology between masculinist and state power, to borrow from Wendy Brown's apt phrasing, could not be clearer. Pavitra was finally escorted to a room in the courthouse to fill out some paperwork before she was returned to the hostel by the police. Later in the day, once the hearing was over, I walked outside the court quarters and saw Paul Kangaraj, surrounded by other lawyers wearing uh, their robes, 
uh, giving a press statement to a large group of television journalists, repeating what he had said in the courtroom about this legal dilemma of what judges should do, in, uh, sorry, what police should do in such a context. Um, and as I noted, the you know, cameras are not allowed in, in the courtroom. That's why people go outside and then give these uh, statements. Um, it was only later in the evening, evening that I saw, along with the wider television viewership, that Pavitra had covered her head and face with a purple dupata before being brought uh, uh, in and escorted out of the courtroom by her handlers. And that was actually the image of her that came to define the case. Uh, the image of the young woman bent over her desk uh, 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 following the proceeding with her face covered, reduced to a body without a face, uh, became the prominent uh, visual impression of the events that had unfolded that day. But more was to follow. The following day, the Times of India headline read, quote, woman whose disappearance caused Ambud violence produced before the Madras High Court. Uh, Dinatandi ran the same in Tamar and gave a great deal of detail about how the judges had grilled her. This is uh, the one in the middle of Dinakaran, which repeats the same type of thing. Uh, the Deccan Chronicle simply said, divorce not sold in shops, according to the judge. Um, uh, and uh, that headline that was repeated in many other dailies and weeklies also provided attractive ticker material for 24 hour news stations. It was Dinamala, the right leaning uh, newspaper that uh, provided the most detailed line by line transcript of the courtroom interaction. Uh, and I've based my thing partly on their reporting. Um, and that newspaper added a twist coupling the story of Pavitra's public shaming with the ersatz legal problems her behavior was accused of uh, raising with an article about how police were also investigating whether she had converted to Islam. The Hindu alone avoided the sensationalism of other papers and television, focusing on tensions in Ambur and refraining from focusing on the judge's words. Um, so that's, you know, the paper of record had a very different uh, line on this. So in addition to the lack of respect accorded to Pavitra, uh, which I'll return to, What's remarkable about the comments uh, made by judges as these were solidified and circulated through the press coverage is the absolute lack of concern with the custodial death of Shamil Ahmed at the hands of the police inspector. That had moved away, that wasn't part of the story. The apparently much more serious problem of a woman's compromised marital chastity across religious lines took center stage, obscuring what everyone privately knew to be the social violence Muslims uh, against Muslims that Shamil's death was uh, symptomatic of. So when hierarchies within hierarchies are transgressed in this manner, so, you know, violence appears like a kind of natural event in many kinds of reporting, uh, obscuring its political character. Pavitra's unapologetic consent in breaking the sexual contract took center stage of a scandal without legal basis, demanding some sort of supplementary action. With some exceptions, um, Notably, Anand Vigaran, which was much more critical to weekly magazine of the, of the police, the mainstream press found this a perfectly sensible exercise in publicly shaming Pavitra for the violence she was accused of calling, causing in the narrative that had been built. Um, and it was in fact online uh, sources like Swarajya uh, that lauded Dinamala for the way they covered the whole story. So, so it was, it was the, the, the right wing of journalism that was actually very intent on highlighting the communal aspects of the story. Um, uh, uh, and, and were lauded for doing so in, in, in the blogosphere. Um, now, while sharing in the misogyny that formed common ground uh, with mainstream news reporting, they derided other media for being soft on minorities. That's, you know, that's a usual accusation. So news coverage of the words and images from the court on the whole appears to have appealed to what editors construed as a popular sense of substantive justice that the law could not provide for a number of news consumers. Um, returning to the events in the courtroom, Pavitra's habeas corpus hearing can be read as an assertion of juridical sovereignty as an Agamben's uh, analysis of the logic of habeas corpus already uh, indicates. Now, from a formal legal perspective, the hearing should have closed with her negative answer to the question of whether she had been deducted against her will. That's what it's supposed to be about, right? But it was in fact only the beginning of an exemplary pedagogical performance, uh, delimiting the margins within the state beyond the strict contents of the law, where Pavitra was taught the difference between membership and belonging. That's a phrase I'm borrowing from Bina Das and Deborah Poole. Her purported misdeed had become a problem for the law, raising questions about her capacity to belong and inciting discourse in lieu of a non-existent legal remedy. The assertion of sovereign power backed by the might of the law 
was maintained, although the claim made by the judges was that they have no jurisdiction over her demand for a divorce. Um, and if the advocate Paul Kanagaraj argued that the court that has no law to deal with these problems allegedly raised by her disappearance. As Justin Richland notes in his analysis of language and jurisdiction, quote, even when legal actors decide that the legal institution they enact through language has no authority to act, the force, authority, and legitimacy of that legal institution is nonetheless being enacted. If Justice Calls Piruman Murgan judgment addressed a much wider social struggle over creative expression in terms of transcendent rights, in this otherwise mundane case, judicial address spoke to the world through the very words renouncing its jurisdiction over Pavitra's demand for a divorce through a sort of punitive constriction. This speaking the law, the anglicization of the Latin jurisdiction, as noted by Richland, enacts the sovereignty of the court and the state it represents while making available textual materials for social sanction well outside the purview of the law in the very same gesture. So most reporting on that case died out um, after this big uh, event at the Madras High Court. But there was further commentary in the magazines and in stuff like that. Uh, and so one magazine actually uh, asked a number of prominent feminist lawyers and writers to comment on what had happened. And they uh, you know, criticized the judges. In particular, um, obviously, the, the you know, divorce is not uh, something that you buy at the corner shop is something they were unhappy with. But in addition, the, the judges were accused of using the, the singular um, uh, form when addressing Pavitra, as opposed to the respectful plural form um, in, in Tamar. And so um, they, this was noted by some people in a, a magazine. And uh, the judges who had read it then uh, accused the magazine of contempt of court. Uh, saying, you know, you, you show us as lacking respect for women and so forth. Um, and it was quickly, it was, it was quietly withdrawn and there was a small apology that was written. And so the, 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 the publisher didn't have at that point the stomach to, to, to you know, uh, to stand by the article um, and thought it would be better to just let it go away. Um, now, the next case I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to do so fairly quickly because I think we're probably running out of time, is a, a, a case in which the contempt of court becomes the news event. Um, and that's um, the, the, the case uh, surrounding the distressing uh, story of Justice C.S. Karnan. Uh, now, he's a judge who threatened a fellow Madras High Court uh, justices, including Justice Call, who was still in Madras High Court at the time, with contempt of court charges, and who was eventually himself jailed on the same charges that were brought against him by the Supreme Court. Um, so shortly after being called to the Madras High Court in 2011, um, Justice Karnan, one of the few Dalit judges at this high level, made national news by writing to the um, National Commission for Scheduled Castes, accusing fellow judges of treating him poorly uh, because of his background, uh, specifically saying that he had been touched inappropriately by the shoes of another judge as a sign of disrespect while the other judges smiled. Um, this is already a noteworthy allegation, but then it became much bigger news because Justice Karnan had a press conference in his chambers, which is something that Till then, no one had done at the Madras High Court. And so he invited the press into his chambers and, and, and made this accusation before the press. Um, journalists were happy to have this big event happen because it meant their reporting was going to be you know, well placed in the newspaper, but they were also a bit you know, unsure of where it was going to go because it didn't seem quite right to, to breach that uh, you know, sacrosanct divide. Um, but then Justice Conan appealed widely to the public via news media, um, uh, trying to halt uh, the chief justice's attempt to interview new justices for possible uh, assignment to the court. Um, he would eventually threaten the chief justice of the Madras High Court with contempt of court hearings when uh, Justice Karnan's stay uh, was reversed by the chief justice. Um, and seeking a way out of this very uncomfortable uh, legal battle that was brewing in the court, um, the Justice Karnan was transferred to the Calcutta High Court. Um, um, but what happened is that he put a stay on his own transfer um, and saying, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to let the High Court transfer me out of my own court. Um, 
this was you know done away with in the in the I'll spare you the Latin. You know, you can't be a judge in your own case. Um, uh, principle uh, um, to which he then responded, you, you know, you've insulted me in front of a general public consisting of a population of 120 crores in India due to lack of legal knowledge um, when he responded to this. Um, so he was saying that it's actually the court that's in contempt of itself. So he started contempt of court proceedings uh, and there's this kind of endless back and forth uh, as he tries to stay in Madras and not be transferred uh, to Calcutta. Um, and of course, this is, you know, the news is going wild over all of this stuff. Um, uh, Justice Cardinal wrote a letter to the Prime Minister of India in which he detailed his charges of corruption um, and uh, he urged the leader to take action uh, to save the topmost image of the judiciary. He went further to call on all political parties of India to extend their fullest cooperation in maintaining an impeccable image at all times, right? So this is about the image of the judiciary in his line of argumentation. Um, now, of course, he was doing these things, um, writing to the prime minister, pursuing all these legal avenues, very much for their display value, um, uh, as much as it was in hopes of official legal remedy. Um, and it, you know, the law became an interesting medium for newsmaking. Um, yeah. So this attack on the court in turn attracted the charge of contempt of court against Justice Cardinal himself, this time leveled by a bench of seven senior justices of the Supreme Court. Um, he at first failed to attend the Supreme Court hearings um, and he was issued available arrest warrant and he was accused of scandalizing the judiciary and eventually found guilty. Now I'm gonna focus a little bit on the Supreme Court judgment because it tells you about um, the dynamic that uh, we've been covering here. I'll, I'll, um, I'll quote from it. They were particularly disturbed by how the image of the court was being represented in, in news media. Quote, his public utterances turned the judicial system into a laughing stock. The local media, unmindful of the damage it was causing to the judicial institution, merrily rode the Karnan wave. Even four media had its dig at the Indian judiciary. And they noted in the judgment itself that they were particularly upset uh, by the fact that BBC was covering this quite closely. That was very upsetting to the, the uh, justices of the Supreme Court. Now, Justice Cardinan was the one who was gonna um, uh, pay for this, not the, the press that was reporting his words, right? He was the one who was gonna be accused of contempt. Uh, they could have gone after the press, then they do so sometimes. But in this case, it seems that they wanted to restrict it uh, to the justice himself. Um, he was sentenced to six months imprisonment for leveling, quote, noxious allegations that were malicious and defamatory against 33 of his colleagues, while he, quote, shielded himself from actions by trumpeting his position as belonging to an underprivileged caste, end quote. Um, he was, Justice Cunningham was then refrained from speaking in public until he had served his time in prison. Um, and then there was a gag order put on the press. So the threat was, if you, if you report on this anymore, we will go after you for contempt of court. Uh, and then the case, you know, dies away. Uh, after his uh, time in jail, Justice Cunningham actually started a political party and sort of tried to pursue his uh, politics by other means. Now, it appeared to many as kind of a catastrophe that had spun out of control. Um, some people call it a tragedy, uh, acknowledging the degree to which the agency of the actors involved in this drama were deeply mediated by publics and institutions well beyond, be outside the law's official purview, even if overdetermined by the law's presence. Um, now, the interesting contrast comes uh, shortly after that, uh, when, of course, we have here in Delhi, another uh, breach that happens uh, when uh, justices from the Supreme Court hold their own press conference uh, outside. Uh, but of course, they're not treated at all in the same way as Justice Cardinal was. And that's something Sura Jengde writes about in Caste Matters, uh, about the, the, the really, the, you know, there's very different kind of narrative surrounding uh, the breach between the media and the judiciary. So this is a social drama unfolding around discrimination and a higher judiciary that finds it very difficult to address it. Um, a longstanding silence had been uh, uh, broken. Um, so it's also a, a tragedy of sorts of a kind of deep personal attachment to something that is perhaps harmful to the socially vulnerable. 
While pursuing justice in the face of perceived caste discrimination, Justice Cardinal was seemingly obsessed with the law. He kept pursuing legal strategies that were also newsmaking strategies, using the law against its official guardians, even if sometimes he had to do so outside of court. And he would, he would write petitions by hand and his, I mean, the, there's, it's a complicated story. Um, but he was ultimately rejected by the law and the state it represents. In uh, anthropologist Bagonia Art Saga's insightful formulation, insofar as, quote, law comes to represent the sovereign power of the state, the intense affect of this power has the capacity to drive people mad, madness that comes from being oversaturated with the law. Justice Cardinan's passionate, reckless recourse to the court of public opinion through his own legal actions, I think can be understood in the context of this awesome power that appears everywhere, structuring the very field of public opinion itself while claiming to stand aloof. Appeal to the public had failed the judge, of course. Uh, and in these events, we can see more clearly how a judge's desire to read about themselves in the morning paper uh, before coffee is part of a media dynamic of feedback loops that can take unexpected and even devastating, maddening turns. Okay, I'm gonna now conclude. Thanks. Yeah, we can stop the things. So we come a very long way from the majestic image of transcendent law invoked in the opening um, in the Pirmal Murugan judgment in the very same courtroom halls uh, where publicity stunts like banning books set the stage for liberal triumph. A judge might publicly shame a young woman who had broken no law or bear the social embarrassment of having a fellow judge barge into proceedings, which is what uh, Justice Karnan did. Uh, every move happening before the public eye. Yet all these stories point to some underlying forces structuring the dynamics of juridical publicity while at the same time opening themselves to a broader set of questions having to do with problems of sovereignty and the vicissitudes of public representation. First, the normative fantasy of a hermit judge whose lonely interpretation of the law locates itself outside of politics or broader social pressures so as to ensure impartiality appears very difficult to sustain. As the language of law continues to dominate the news cycle, the pressures of mass mediation on legal reasoning are becoming more and more apparent. We need only read the numerous discussions of uh, news media in legal judgments and observations as evidence of how judges are reflexive about the fact of mass circulation of juridical discourse. While there's a long tradition of the higher judiciary using its uniquely authoritative position to comment and intervene in the world at large from the courtroom pulpit in India, um, and I would point you to Anuj Bhavani's book uh, about public interest litigation for his, that story. The proliferation of news media technologies and formats is perhaps also changing the quality of judicial address. Um, it's no longer through the, the long judgment uh, alone. If judges had addressed the world largely through judge, uh, written judgments, which are adorned with a rich literary textuality, as in the Pirumal Murgan judgment, contemporary media logics demand more contained easily circulatable texts and sensationalist affect. The moralist denouncement of Pavitra through comparing her request for divorce to shopping provided just such a textual form. Even Justice Call's insightful prose in defense of liberalism inherent in Indian traditions was easily reduced to a soundbite demanding that the author be resurrected. It was written in bold as if uh, to call out to less diligent reporters that that was the take home point. To be a successful judge in such an environment is to be media savvy, it appears, and to pay attention to one's public image. The second more abstract point to draw from these cases has to do with what uh, the anthropologist Webb Keen once called the hazards of representation and the question of law as the public face of state sovereignty. That the law and juridical discourse are frequently cited across contexts far from official origins would appear on the surface to present a problem for state power as understood through the lens of unified sovereignty. Lack of control over representation of the law might seem to be a weakness. However, we owe to Vina Das the insight that in the life of the state, this very, quote, iterability becomes a sign not of vulnerability, but a mode of circulation through which power is produced, such that legal discourse can penetrate into people's lives and yet remain distant and elusive. We might recall in this context how Justice Call's words serve not only to liberate Birman Murugan, but also to project an image of legal authority over Indian tradition. 
It's the same pervasiveness of judicial discourse and its citation across contexts that allowed for the casual observations made to Pavitra concretize and legitimate a narrative that pins communal harmony back on the problem of a woman's chastity. Shamil's death at the hands of police was rendered irrelevant in the public circulation of the case, as if the state bore no responsibility for the right. So it's not because of the iterability of the law that the state is made weak or vulnerable. Missing a page here. The vulnerability of the power of the judiciary that results from its dependence on uh, mass publicity has to do with an aspect of circulation not examined in Das's work. And so I'm taking a perspective that brings questions of uh, communal capitalism and sort of the drive to circulation to the fore um, to see how um, this circulation is, um, is, makes the law vulnerable because it is sort of entangled in the engines of mass circulation. And that there are other forces propelling legal reporting that are have to be balanced with the recognition of the majesty of the law, which the reporters are invested in too, with other demands, right? And sometimes those demands are a spectacular case. And so judges, you know, form just a small part of the readership um, and have to deal with this other sort of force that's propelling legal reporting uh, in directions that might not satisfy uh, the sort of the, the legal demand for an aesthetic image. Um, and of course, now more recently, you've seen judges kind of now partake in that uh, as they engage much more with media than perhaps they would have in the past. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that uh, because I think I've already spoken for quite a long time. But thanks. Thank you. I'm just going to start off with a quick, quick set of comments, and then uh, you know, then I'll open it up. And uh, one is, you know, I, I, this is kind of when you read the chapter. It's got, it's a kind of multiple mediatized performances. There's this, it's also part of it is very funny. You know, the first part, which you did present today is actually quite funny, <laughs> which is uh, this, by funny, I mean, it's the magic, you know, what, what Tausi calls the magic of the state, where you, you're not sure whether it's humor, this, this flip between humor and death. Uh, and, you know, presence and disavowal, you know, the law of flipping these, these different uh, things. So you enact a body and the body disappears, you know, and literature, I think, captures it well, but sometimes you're not sure what you're watching. And I think this chapter is kind of flipping between these two. Now, the first question is this. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship now on saturation. Hmm. Saturation is an environmental condition of media, but also of life where uh, what saturation does is it, it kind of blurs these bo the boundary making uh, biopolitical strategies that you know Foucault talked about. So what saturation does, it makes speech very vulnerable. And judicial speech is a huge problem because judicial speech is noted for particularity and punctuality of expression. So what, what do you think saturation does in this context? And what does it do to the earlier Veena Das argument? Because there's a, there's a self, the sense in which I think you're referencing Vina, mm -hmm. but clearly the world that Vina addressed has been blown up, completely blown up. And I wouldn't, I don't think she would disagree with me when I say this. So, what is this event, which is uh, which is always in anxiety of its boundary disappearing, right? So the legal event is a very big event. We see our you know Chief Justice giving us news conference every day. I, I think 25 years ago I could not even thought about it. So there's something that it does to judicial speech in the court, outside the court. That's, these are the kind of, set, one of the anthropology que law question, event questions. So the first set of questions, then I'll open it up. Okay. So um, the theme of media saturation is a really old one. That's what I find kind of interesting. I, you know, it dates back to the 70s postmodernist concerns with the collapse in representation, uh, with uh, our inability to distinguish uh, signs from commodities. Um, but it has obviously taken on a really different life in the world in which we live um, because it's one that it's not just postmodern philosophers are worried about. It seems to be a generalized anxiety. Um, the fact that we live lives that are always recorded is something that um, was unthinkable uh, in earlier generations. And that makes the, the legal speech particularly vulnerable, right? 
um, and, and the kind of shields that were available uh, to protect the sanctity of legal speech as tied to the law seem to be melting away in some important respects. Um, now, going to the question of uh, the, the event, and um, you know, I was greatly inspired by Mina Das's Critical Events book, and in particular, the chapter on communities as political actors, uh, where um, she, she looks at um, the Shabano case in great detail, the, the judgment. Um, and that provided uh, with a kind of methodological inspiration, but of course, we're facing a, a radically different world in which um, that type of analysis now needs to be understood through the lens of the media event. The judge who's participating in a high profile case, even a low profile case, um, is well aware of the fact that they're gonna be, uh, it's gonna be, it's mediatized from the beginning, right? And they're, they're acting according to, um, I think you, I, I had that quote from Stiegler, like people anticipating the recordability of their actions is, is now a part of public consciousness. And that changes the quality of the event quite radically um, because it is how you're being recorded is a, a large part of the eventhood, right? Um, uh, it's not that the, the, the legal judgment itself was the important thing in the Shabano case and the discussion that went around it. But now how is the legal discussion being circulated, misconstrued, uh, you know, off, often purposefully um, uh, miscited is the concern that not only judges have, but everyone has, right? And so the event now is in some respects harder to contain, right? Because the critical event, it was clear what the event was. Uh, everyone knew, right? There, there was a kind of a, a consensus in, in the Vinodasian sense of the critical event. Now, these are what some people might call quasi events or so forth, things that might appear relatively mundane that become really large for a very short period of time and then die out. Things that we might think should be considered massive events in the history of, I mean, in, in, in Dasa's sense, it was in the history of the nation state, uh, but we might, that doesn't need to be the only frame, but things that we perhaps think should be considered to be massive events are no longer, don't carry the same ontological weight, I think because of this question of saturation. And, um, I, and, and that is something that is now a public concern. It's not, it's not an esoteric thing, it's something we're all worried about. Um, as teachers, we're worried about it, as, as researchers, right? The recordability of everything, and it's, you know, it's being archived, it's being out there and retrievable, is something that um, is now a source of, of, of great anxiety. And I've, I know, I've just looked at this kind of legal aspect of it, but it's, it's, it's one that has very much generalized. So it's, it becomes harder to kind of pinpoint what is an event, right? I mean, what is a break from the normal? Um, these are not clear ruptures. Nothing I've talked about is actually a clear rupture from what happened before. So it doesn't carry the same sense of event uh, that the, the, the kind of the, the Vina Das had. Yeah, open this up. And I'd like to com come back, you to come back later on this idea of the field. What is the anthropological field today? Right, uh, you know, in this kind of very technical, mediatized environment, because there's all this history of the encounter with, with the particular field. You write about the encounter, you know, to, to go back to Stiegler again, you know, he says once with the coming of technology, we are haunted by an externalized memory of a life we never lived, and we articulate a life to come because we are recording it now. So it's a kind of two way process. You're recalling something because it's record, you know, so this is, it's a very, please carry on. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Tanuj. Um, I actually want to take, uh, uh, you know, go back to um, the Pavitra case that you spoke about and uh, how the law spoke to her and sort of moralized and infantilized and so on. Um, and you said, you know, there's a homology between the social contract and the sexual contract uh, and how the law sort of reinforces that. Um, which, of course, Vina Das in Life and Word says is foundational to the nation state when she talks about women who are being returned to their families. Um, and she uh, writes about how in speaking to them, they have a kind their speech has a kind of frozen quality. It, it, it's, it's sort of what she calls voiceless. She says that, you know, they, they appeared, it appeared as if they weren't really saying anything, but they were still using words um, because, you know, of the kinds of violence that they might have experienced. Um, 
but in in pavitra's case what was interesting to me was that she spoke back to the law she was asked a question and she spoke back and she said no um i wasn't so i didn't go against my will and i wanted a divorce um so i'm curious to know about how uh you know in this environment of circulation saturation um new media how was her speech treated by by the kind of news media that you were engaging with um and what if any other kind of liberatory possibilities there without trying to you know say that her her speech was liberatory in any way um but say say by instance for in, in relation to the law say for instance by influencing other cases or you know that might be a second order thing but like how was her speech treated in in media was it um was it silenced again or was it you know so it's not just about how how the law spoke to her but it's also about how she sort of spoke to the law that's what i'm interested in i mean i think one of the, what was remarkable is the lack of focus on pavitra as a speaker right i mean it was all about the images um and i think that that no was um, was seen as uh, nothing other than a trigger for the moralizing, right? Had had she not said it so clearly and forcefully, it would not have uh, demanded this kind of almost retribution. I mean, you could think of the the way in which she was spoken to in that sense. Um, and so it was um, perhaps even outrageous, but disavowed as such. Um, and so I don't know that I would see much in the way of liberatory readings of that. Um, but it did, of course, provide this critical discourse around how the judges spoke to her. And so, um, but it, you know, it, there's a way in which herself as a subject is constantly, you know, she's a cause, she's an agent, but the, 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 an, agent, an agency without subjectivity in the way in which she was represented in uh, in the media, even the media that was critical of judges, right? And so it's um, you know it's kind of a classic Spivakian moment of uh, not being able to speak, um, uh, and that's that's the only way I can read it. How it was represented in, in mass media. Well, you yeah. You tap it and see if it works. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. I, I really uh, can you hear me. Yeah. Uh, really enjoyed it and uh, lots to think about. But I just uh, was thinking about uh, you ended with you know this kind of the, the relationship between the law, its sovereignty, its sort of hermetic quality, it's, it pretends to stand outside above everything, and then the kind of pull of this mediatization. Uh, and there's an odd, like this, as you explained, there's a tension between because it seems to make the law more vulnerable, but also seems to give it new forms of. Oh, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also gives it uh, new forms of like, I don't know, uh, authority, new forms of like power. So I, I was struck by the scene, the Pavitra scene that uh, the, the previous speaker spoke about, which was that. Uh, you mentioned that the head of the bar council, right, the advocate council, he just out of turn without any local stand, I spoke, and yes. that was allowed. Yeah, and that sort of kind of you know led to a different uh, whole different thing. And so I was wondering about whether the idea of the hermetic law, you know, whether it is it comes from certain kind of courtroom spaces, and once you look at the law from the trial court, I'm familiar with the trial court in Ahmedabad, but that you or look at courtroom spaces, perhaps that that kind of then gives us a different sense of what what the law was doing and how it approached or what kinds of bodies could come in. So I don't know if the, if it makes sense, but I was just wondering if some of what you felt in the courtroom and the bodies and the spaces and, and then its mediatization, could you speak about the relationship between those two things? Yeah, if that... yeah. I mean, I, I, I must emphasize that I think a lot of what the dynamic I'm talking about is particular to this, you know, the high court, Supreme Court world of cases that, you know, eyes are really, um, that, that draws a lot of attention. Um, and hence this, you know, deep anxiety about whether or not to let cameras into the courtroom, uh, which they are still not allowed in um, 
uh, in, in the Madras High Court. Um, then that seems to also incite forms of description in the press that you know want to make up for that. And so the Tamil press was amazing and it's the, the amount of detail that it gave about this encounter uh, around a case that had no legal basis at all, right? So I'm, I'm not talking about the law as, as lawyers talk about it. I'm talking about the law as this thing that people imagine and consume in, uh, in, in mass media, uh, which is not what this is not legal study. I, have, I make no claims on media, doing media here. Um, and so there's, there seems to be a great appetite for this kind of detail to, to, to almost make up for the lack of visual images. And then the visual images that you do get, you know, when they're as striking as the one of Pavitra with her Dupata and stuff, uh, come to define the case uh, and, and in a very interesting way kind of um, supplement the words of the judge, you know, that, that kind of, um, um, you know, there's a lot that's particular to that case. So I, don't, I, I don't know how much I want to generalize. Um, but there is something about spectacular court cases that people demand not only exquisite detail of what happened, but also kind of a moral, like the narrative has to be filtered through a kind of moral message about like, this is the takeaway, this is how the case should have been. Or, and of course, people are very rarely very critical of judges in the press. It's working. Okay, great. Yeah. My name is Sanjoy. I'm from Jindal University. I have a pretty straightforward question. Uh, with the progressive transparency in courts, uh, you can see them online, sure. especially with the constitutional bench uh, yeah. uh, hearings. Do you see the role of the media uh, being stymied or being essentially taken away? And what do you predict about? What's your prediction on this? This is something I've been asked to write about, and I'm very weary of making any sorts of predictions. Um, um, I mean, there's, okay, so what's what's happening? Clearly, um, that kind of reflexivity that went into wanting to read about yourself in the newspaper is now happening in real time in a way that is going to affect how people speak. Um, I, that's, a, I think, a fair prediction to make. Um, I don't think the media's role is going to go away in any because of the the way in which it has to be clipped into an, a circulatable event, and and so news media, you know, whether it's, they're citizen journalists or professional um, media houses, uh, play this role of of providing that frame uh, to make it a circulatable event. Um, and I, I think that's something that kind of continues because there's, there's a logic that's kind of independent of people who are actually really interested in following the case and so forth, right? I mean, many of us are scholars and we actually read, you know, live law when it's happening and stuff, but uh, that's, we're very few. Uh, um, the world is driven by this capacity to draw a frame around something and have it circulate as a commodity. Um, and so I don't think the role of the media is going to lessen in any respect because of that transparency. Um, uh, they'll have more varied material to work with. Um, now, perhaps some of the kind of the, the secrecy that gives the heightened aura thing that kind of gives media representation a lot of its power is going to change. The contours of that are going to change probably. That's as far as I'm willing to predict. Thank you very much. That was really, I mean, some of the cases I do have, uh, the Babitra case was very well known for all of us, but even the Justice Karna case yeah. uh, was, I do remember because of the weird nature of that event. So the three stray thoughts. One has to do uh, with the Justice Karna case, but has neither to do with law nor media, but the question of sociology which is to say that one thing that is not publicly debated uh, in the Indian context is actually caste and gender representation in the higher courts. Yes. And in some ways, neither the media 
nor the court itself, nor the political domain has taken up this question. Very recently, there was, a, there was one woman Supreme Court judge who uh, came into the bench and, you know, even that reporting was muted, yes. as in it was not celebrated to show that finally you're allowing women in. Uh, so what does that say about the public interface uh, or the social interface of courts and its image of you know, social transcendence that you were saying? Yes. And whether Justice Kern could have done anything but uh, what he was doing, which is staging a huge drama yeah. for the media. So that was one thought that I had. The second thought is at a very abstract level, which is to ask, so there are some legal systems, such as the US, where there has been an institutionalized public interface, which is a highly managed and choreographed public interface, which is that of the jury. Mm -hmm. And in jury systems, as we know, that one of the primary instructions that the judge is to give to the jury when the selection happens is that you have to shut yourself from the media. And they can say that because there is a kind of institutional public interface, which is a representative section of the nation's public. Now, in a context, and there has been a long debate in from colonial times, why India should not go the jury way mm -hmm. and should only go the judge way. Uh, is there something there to be thought about of whether the, the, the legal system can internalize a public interface as a, at least a supplementation of the media interface? Or has that been thought about at all? Or has that been a question of debate at all? And uh, there was a third thought, which I'm forgetting now. I'll, I'll leave it at that time. Huh? Oh, just wanted to quickly ask, this is just a query. Mm. Is there a politics to when judges allow in-camera proceedings and when they don't? And is there some public debate about why X trial went in camera and Y trial wasn't? Just wanted to know that. Okay, so now you're really testing me on the legal side of things, which I've already told you. I, I, I. <laughs> um, no, but the first one is um, is one that I think is um, so. Th the fact that caste and gender representation in the judiciary is, is very rarely discussed publicly, right? Um, and that's precisely what was so embarrassing about the case, right? Because it became an obvious point of reference that no one really wanted to talk about, but he kept making it an issue. Um, and then in the response, the Supreme Court then has to explicitly say, he's the one who made it the issue. And so that's why it was so embarrassing. Um, and in, in that respect, that, that would help us understand the, the moves that Justice Cardinal made, uh, which many took to be not you know, very wise for his career. Um, but nevertheless, to, to make this point that this is not talked about, right? it is just not talked about. Um, and of course, there are very, they're not explicit rules in the press, but they're very strong tacit norms about when you name something as a caste problem versus not. Um, and so that this case blew that open because the explicit accusation was that I'm being treated differently. Um, and so that's precisely why the response was so vehement. Um, um, and he was using the law to do so, right? Um, and so that is, is, is precisely, you know, it's not taken up, but this was this kind of blip, which everyone found disturbing, um, but then created all these interesting conversations around it. Um, and, and it actually made it a conversation in the Tamil speaking world. Justice Chandru spoke quite a bit about it in a number of new shows, that this is something we should be talking about. And whether or not you agree with the methods that he pursued, this is, a, this is an issue. Um, and so that's why it was a, an important event um, for all its kind of strange drama. Um, the other ones I find very difficult to, um, to reply to because of my ignorance. Um, institutionalized public interface. Um, there are certainly ways in which the judiciary could 
you know, I mean, this public circulation of judgment seems to be the primary way through which that happens. And that's where the obiter dicta does become important because you explain why you made it. Um, and so that is a, a form of publicly institutionalized um, uh, uh, interface, um, but it is rooted through um, news media. Obviously it's available online uh, and Indian Kanun is, is wonderful for researchers and so forth. But once again, we have to separate the researchers from most people who are gonna consume this uh, through televised news or, or whatever. And so that's the, the fact that that institutionalized um, interface is always already mediatized um, in, in this particular way is what defines the field. Um, in camera proceedings versus that, I really can't answer with any authority. So no, no, I encountered an interesting thing and, and this is the part of the chapter I didn't talk about. Funniest part. The funniest part, yeah. So there was a, a semi-riot on the court campus over um, a, a law requiring people to wear motorcycle helmets. Um, there were already a lot of other tensions brewing in the campus that I didn't totally understand, uh, but the lawyers uh, came and kind of attacked the court physically. Um, and so those lawyers, when they were uh, reprimanded, um, were th that was an interesting event where they were in, in that case of contempt of court, the lawyers were in camera and there was no one allowed into the courtroom, but it was televised. And so televisions were set up outside the courtroom. And that's like the one time that a court proceeding was actually televised <laughs> because it was in camera. So that's, that's the one case that I know about, but it, yeah. And so it's actually, it becomes much more transparent uh, in a very strange way. Um, so that, but that's, that's like, that's a case I can talk about. I, I can't talk about the, the longer history of it. When you read this chapter, you first you're laughing because he starts with, you're laughing, non, I was laughing, non, and then you come to this very dark, you know, encounter, which is Pavitra's, the Pavitra's case, and then it moves into other things. Yes, Ravikant and then Sarah. Okay. I, I was, I'm curious about, you know, judges uh, acknowledging, of course, that they read the newspapers. But do they also comment on the me what is known as media trial, right? Of course, there is a structure, inbuilt structure. It, you go to the lower court, then high court, then Supreme Court. There's a, a structure of expectation that, get, that gets built. And the media does play a very active role. That is how it becomes spectacular. But do they also, along the way, comment on the media is my question. Yes, I mean, they're constantly, uh, you know, calling things media trials and they're constantly chastising the media for making thing a media trial. That's, that's, that's kind of a constant in these spectacular cases. Um, and then you get to the ultimate point of the gag order, which is what happened in the case of Justice Cudman, because the media was doing too, playing too strong a role in defining the case for the Supreme Court. And so they were the universal gag order. You're not to write about this ever that was it. it, just put a stop to it. And so the media trial is a source of constant um, anxiety and commentary from the judiciary. And then uh, as you saw in, the, um, in, in this case as well, it enters into the judgments where they're constantly saying that this, this whole trial has been overdetermined by the fact of it's being reported on. Um, and so they're very worried about it, even as they're often using it, right? Uh, as, as a means of expressing themselves. And that's the dynamic that I'm really trying to capture in this. Uh, then it used to happen earlier, right? Would you have a, would you agree with that? Yeah. But growing mediatization, right? The growing mediatization of the trial has often led to, I mean, foregone conclusions on the part of the public about someone's guilt or innocence. Uh, I, we can name a number of cases at a national level. I can name a number of cases from Tamil Nadu. Um, where it's the media that decides someone's guilty. Um, and uh, sometimes they die before they even go to trial, as has happened in a number of cases.
Okay, I have two questions. Um, first of all, thanks. I really enjoyed the talk and it's lovely to get to hear you talk about it. Oh. Okay, so two questions are to come back to one of the things that you started us off with Ravi thinking about, which is the relationship between spectacle and value. So can you just, I was thinking about that through the rehearsal of that, and can you just rehearse for us in these news events, what kind of value, Yeah, better. Less feedback. Yeah. Although that was kind of fitting for the topic. Feedback's a big thing here. Yeah. Okay. So spectacle and value. Can you just rehearse for us in these accounts? Uh, what kind of value is produced for whom is it produced? Like who, who gets it? And by what kinds of mechanisms actually? Because I can see kind of media, spectacle, law, and then I sort of get confused. So that's one. Okay. On um, those what like can you just talk me through what's happening with value here? Mm -hmm. And what kind and for whom and like what and my other question is maybe connected or maybe not is a quite audience question because that's the one I've been trained to <laughs> ask. So it seems like in your also in your accounts, like I wasn't totally sure who, what the audience was, or if in a media spectacle, the question of audience actually collapses. So if it doesn't, is it the case that it's the media performing itself to itself and the members of the court performing themselves to themselves? Or is there, you know, like the reader, like the uh, um, Dinamala reader yeah. is obviously is there, but doesn't seem to be a character in the story, but again, maybe that's just didn't come out in my Okay, so the first one is the more abstract one. Um, so court cases become spectacle uh, via their, their mediatization and produce value, um, obviously for the news media. This is what they tr sell. Um, and that's kind of a well-known story. They also can produce value for the judge. Um, and, and Justice Sanjay Kaul is a very well-known and respected judge because of how he is able to take part in quite spectacular cases uh, and how he handles it. Um, but it's also, he's very vulnerable to that source of value production because sometimes uh, it, there'll be a contradiction between the, the the logic of media value production and the logic that gives value to the judge as uh, uh, as 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 you know the law has to somehow present itself as outside of that. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know the law should not be a commodity. Uh, if there's anything, it shouldn't be, and that is the source of a, like a kind of a prime contradiction that these judges have to ride as they craft their public images. And so um, the spectacle is the, the node that connects these two vectors of value. That doesn't satisfy you at all. No. Yeah. Scott, what do you say? Oh, sorry. Making up for the fact that they hadn't been able to see what happened. Yeah. Like that seems to me like a more compelling spectacle in a sense of something really special and unusual happening. Mm -hmm. People drumming up publicity for themselves. I don't know, but that's, sorry. Well, you keep I think going. that might connect to your audience question. Um, so who's the audience? I think, so in the case of the Petra habeas corpus hearing, I think there was definitely an audience in mind, an audience that, rec that wanted someone to be punished for this, disaster that's unfolding in Umbur. And she becomes a classic scapegoat. Uh, not having broken a single law, she becomes a cause. And that, I think, is a sense of a perceived audience of like, okay, this is what people are going to want from this. I later asked, uh, I'm, I'm fairly friendly with the Times of India guy who wrote the article. Um, and I asked him about that headline a few years later, like, in that didn't strike me as a very good headline. I tried to be gentle. Um, and he agreed, yeah, yeah, that wasn't really what it was about. But, you know, this is how you get readers into this thing. Um, and so there is an imagined, there is a sense of a reader. I mean, the real audience, I, I meet random people, you know, that my life passes through. 
but um, they're, 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 the editor or the, and I know the newspaper business is a little better, they have a sense of who their readership is. And if you cross certain lines, they're going to get angry with you and write letters and start boycott campaigns, as have been, there are many boycott campaigns against the Hindu, for example, uh, because of how they've represented certain issues like this. Um, so there is always this, this you know, it's a, it's a virtual figure that seems to motivate uh, styles of representation, right? Like in film, I mean, it, it is something people learn about. Um, so the audience is this kind of virtual actor that um, only comes to life sometimes when they, when they react through letters or through violence or whatever. Yeah. Really nice. And I want to end, oh, there's one more, of course. And just a small, uh, simple question, Frank. Uh, um, not, not not from judges, but the media people, the reporters, and those doing the report in the writing. Uh, uh, in cases where, I mean, how many of them are women doing the reporting, and how does that influence the way in which they report and the representation happens? And in this particular domain, in the domains that you're covering, uh, does that influence it at all, or is there a different logic that uh, that sort of takes over? So, uh, that was clear enough. Yeah, so that's something I write about more in the chapter. There's a clear uh, divide between uh, the written word, which is dominated by men, and uh, the television camera, uh, before which women are often reporting. Um, uh, and that, uh, so that divide is one in which it's hard to separate um, gender from uh, media of representation. Um, of course, you know, the, Women might be reporting in front of the courthouse, you know, before a television camera, but that'll then be remediated in the when they come take the footage back to the um, to the office, and then it gets commented on. Uh, but there's a very clear gender divide, and I, it's, I I would assume that that does play a large role in how it's being reported. Um, I you know I don't, I think a woman would have been much less likely to go with that headline, uh, is a guess I can make. Um, but that it's a very clear divide. Um, that uh, is quite institutionalized in um, in the Tamar news world. I don't know as much about other contexts. And where and when you see exceptions to that rule, um, so for example, the News Minute is a South Indian online publication that covers a lot of uh, important political stuff in Tamil Nadu. The reporting is really different because many of the reporters are women, and that's a that's a kind of line that they take that we're going to give you a different story because we have different reporters, um, and that's kind of an explicit editorial line. I, I, in one closing comment, I mean, it was very interesting, I think, uh, because uh, law and media is a zone, we've engaged with that, and I'd address what Sarah brought up. One is one interesting closing thing is this, one thing the dispersal of value does with the, now you have the classic modernist text, you know, Kafka's Before the Law, which is the subject addressing, addressing power, right? And now you have this dispersal of value, a law has this kind of narcotic draw, so a good, good example. Sedition cases, how are sedition cases filed? They're filed by activists, right-wing activists, who will go, they'll stream themselves filing the complaint. They will give screenshots of the complaint. They will, a lot of researchers have done, you know, one of our researchers, Shruti Koshik, has done ex work on this. So they film, so there's a kind of dispersal of value and reassertion of legal value. During the pandemic, you're talking of all the territories that are live streamed. And there's a whole different sensorium that plays around it, right? So different groups are releasing clips and circulating it. So we need to work through this expansion, what this means for legal speech and legal authority and this idea of the event. Yeah. And it's kind of, by narcotic, I mean, you're drawn towards it. You just can't escape it, but it injures you. So it's a, it's a kind of flip that we have to deal with. Anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for starting this season. And, uh, you know, we are going to have an, another session very soon. So all the best. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. Thanks.